Hey everybody, welcome to our GPCRs and VR video series where we're going to be discussing another paper from Sose Haptars and talking about uh, the work that they've been doing related to GPCRs, like the one that we have here. And today joining us, we have Mike and Daniel to talk about the science behind GPCRs. So calcitonin receptor-like receptor, it's a human protein. It is a receptor for calcitonin gene-related peptide, which is the peptide we see here in pink. There's just a little gap here from the crystallization, but yeah, it, um, the terminus down here is buried down this receptor and the other terminus here interacts at the interface of the calcitonin-like receptor in green and the RAMP1 protein, which is uh, here in blue. So what happens is that the association of the calcitonin receptor like with um, different RAMP proteins, they produce different receptors. In this case, with RAMP1, it produces the CGRP receptor. And uh, yeah, it's a heterodimeric uh, receptor because of that. And then down there in orange, we just see the G protein uh, for downstream signaling purposes. But here's where the membrane, the plasma membrane, cell membrane would be. And this would be the exterior. So the peptide would come from the exterior and just get anchored here, binding in here. So it's a peptide that's expressed highly when there's a um, problem with migraines, right? And so uh, <clears throat> what we're doing is to try to develop some drugs that would disrupt the area where the peptide would bind, thereby diminishing the you know the bad effects that people experience with um, migraines such as aura or you know headaches and things like that. And yeah, so when, when we talk about the, the area where it binds, um, yeah, because it's such a long peptide, we're talking about everywhere on here, or are there uh, particular you know areas of interest? Yeah, the peptide's really interesting in that it it does have its end terminus way down in the transmembrane domain, uh, and yet it extends out to the extracellular loop out here where its C terminus binds. So. An antagonist doesn't have to block all the interactions. It just has to bind to the receptor in a way that prevents this ligand from binding. So it's going to be really interesting when we look at the antagonist to see where they bind in the receptor. And this, this has been a target to treat migraine for a number of years now. And several companies have tried. Some have failed uh, due to liver toxicity. But Two, two compounds are on the market already, Ubrojapant and Remegipant. One was originally discovered by Merck. The other one was originally discovered by BMS. So another interesting structural feature of this receptor is that we can see how the RAMP1 protein here in bluish, it, it's a single transmembrane domain uh, here, this helix that crosses the plasma membrane. And then we have in green is the GPCR from the calcitonin-like receptor there are seven transmembrane domains. So this would be embedded in the membrane. And um, yeah, and this part over here uh, regulates, uh, you know, modulates here the, you know, the interaction with the peptides and, um, and the receptors. So it has implications in many physiological processes within the body. And most particularly, as we mentioned, is in this case, this drug was developed for migraine but other applications potentially could be loss of appetite and, and other other conditions. Great. Why don't we pull up 6ZIS and look at uh, where Heptari started their work in this paper. Right. So I'm going to overlay these two structures. Yeah, we see here in this, this drug is just disrupting the, the area where the peptide will bind. And so... By doing that, it's it's supposed to improve, you know, the symptoms of migraine. It's not uncommon for small molecules that interact with GPCRs to bind somewhere in the transmembrane domain, maybe near the top of the transmembrane domain. And so this is very interesting that in this case, when you're trying to block this neuropeptide, it actually is out here in the extracellular domain, interacting with both the GPCR and a little bit with the ramp too, which I think is quite important for binding. So very interesting. Right, yeah, they, both the peptide and the drug interact at the interface of the GPCR and the ramp one receptor. And so they just disrupt uh, <clears throat> uh, its function. 
very interesting and then yeah we see the g protein in orange down here which which will you know um trigger some downstream signaling effects depending on what's going to be binding here and how it binds right yeah well why don't we focus in on this compound that uh so say hep heptari started with this is a a, a compound a, a lead compound that they had that binds very well to the receptor but it doesn't have the the drug-like properties that they wanted because they want a drug that they can give non-orally they want to give it maybe iv or intranasally and what they wanted to do it to be is very water soluble and very potent what they did is they looked at this ligand and it's in pink here and they they basically broke it up into four quadrants uh one two, three, and four. And each one of these is important for the interactions with, with the receptor. And, they, and in this paper, they really just made systematic changes at these positions to optimize a, a new compound that they want to take into the clinic. Um, and, mm -hmm. and one thing that I think is important is that if we look at this piece here, they actually decided in their early work that this piece was already optimized. So they actually left this the same in, in their optimized structure. So if we, if we open up this other structure and overlay it. The, the magenta is actually the drug that's being developed by Sose Heptaris. And um, the, the pink is the one they started with, right? Yeah, so it's, so it's really interesting. Uh, how similar these compounds are, but they are picking up some subtly different interactions too. Uh, but most of the interactions are the same. They really just optimized for drug-like properties. So if I, if I hide the first one and we just look at this, we can see some of the key interactions that the ligand makes with the receptor. So it, I mentioned that they didn't change this, but over here they have this piperidine, which was a perfect fit and it gave them nice properties. And it's really interesting because it forms a nice hydrogen bond, yeah, to that aspartic acid 71 there uh, through a water. So a really important interaction with the ramp protein. And then we can see this indazole right. back here, right near Daniel, is really good for water solubility and properties. And yet it also fits in there really well to pick up additional interactions with that ramp protein that you can see right in front of you, Daniel. And then if we, if we go up to the top here, we've got this spiro piece. And now this is picking up a number of really important interactions with the G protein. Uh, some of these interactions are through water, as we see here to the tyrosine mm. nitrogen. And then some are direct, as we see here to the threonine carbonyl of the backbone. Mm. And then, yeah, up, and up here- Another one uh, with the ramp up here with this- uh, yeah, through the water. So, so really interesting interactions here. And I think what's interesting about this paper is when you're using structure-based drug discovery, when you have a really good uh, structure of a molecule bound, you can make rational changes. And in the paper, they actually report making a really small number of compounds to get from the lead that we saw here to the drug. So if you look at the pink, the light pink versus the darker color, you can see these, these molecules are pretty similar. They're picking up a lot of the same interactions with the ramp and with the GPCR, but they've now optimized it to be highly water soluble and highly potent and have good pharmacokinetics. So a really nice example of using structure and earlier knowledge in the literature to quickly optimize to a drug candidate. Right, and they're hoping to deliver it uh, subcutaneously, right? Just to avoid some liver damage, apparently. Yeah, so it would be an injectable, most likely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you to the Sose Haptaris team, Sarah Bucknell and everybody else that worked on the great paper. And we hope to see you next time in VR. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.